I'm Michelle Ackley. My parents both grew up on council estates, and as a family, we understand the difference social housing can make to people's lives. Millions of families across the UK are struggling to find affordable housing. So this is my front room and my bedroom together. Many are living in temporary or overcrowded conditions, desperate for somewhere decent to live. This is our room where we sleep, and this is what we've got at the minute. We can't really call it our home. But some social housing tenants are abusing the system, holding on to properties they no longer need. When somebody applies for housing, you expect them to live in a property, and when they don't, it just starts to take the mickey. Or even worse, making a small fortune by illegally subletting them. He was charging beyond £1,500 a month. He exploited this completely to his advantage. So I'm with housing investigators cracking down on tenancy cheats. What a waste. You want to commit tenancy fraud? Bother coming here. Reclaiming properties. I need to uh, speak to you, please. They see an opportunity and they think they're not going to get caught. And giving them to families in genuine need. That's how a council house should be. It should be loved and looked after. This is Council House Crackdown. Today, a £43,000 fraud as a top earner pleads poverty to Con Croydon Council. She was paying £700 a month to drive a car, yeah, yeah. yet had applied for a council house property. Yeah, yeah, and claimed benefits. An inside job as a council worker cons colleagues out of a social housing property. I always like to think that I've seen everything, but often that's not the case. And a five-year quest to bring a suspected fraudster to justice. There are people in need, and that is what drives us on. We see families that are desperate for housing and well we're going to deal with that the idea of social housing is that it provides secure and stable accommodation for people on low incomes or with particular needs it is not intended for those on high incomes or for those who drive an expensive car and pay for private education our first case expert a successful businesswoman leading a double life to cheat authorities out of £43,000 in benefits and a highly sought after social housing property. It is a shocking thing and there's no need for them to do it. It is pure greed. Croydon, South London. Population 300. As this bustling London borough continues to expand, so too does the demand social housing. Gail Campbell is a tenancy investigations officer for Croydon Council. When her colleagues in the housing office received an application from 45-year-old Angela Brown, they assumed they were dealing with a claimant in desperate need of help. Angela Brown came to Croydon Council and reported herself to be a homeless single parent with one child. According to Brown, she'd been living with her daughter at a friend's house, but was forced to leave when the friend decided that the house was becoming overcrowded. There are nearly 5,000 households on the social housing waiting list in Croydon, but as a homeless single mother, Angela Brown was giving the highest priority. In March 2006, the London Borough of Croydon were able to offer her a place to call her own. That application that she made was successful. She was housed in a council property, her and her daughter, and she would continue as a council tenant. And, and pay rent to the council. Angela Brown settled into a three-bedroom council property in New Addington, and as far as the authorities were concerned, that was the end of the matter. But in 2008, a phone call to Croydon Council aroused suspicions. There was a, an anonymous tip-off from somebody that said that we'd housed her into a council property when she already had a property of her own, and that property was habitable. Investigators were alarmed. By now, Angela Brown had been living at the new Addington address for two years. They conducted a land registry check against the name of Angela Brown. What they discovered suggested the tip-off was accurate. We were able then to make a check on the land registry and confirm that she did in fact own another property. Two and a half years before being awarded a council property, she'd purchased this flat in Thornton Heath. 
Angela Brown wasn't a homeless single mother in need of social housing. She was a property owner. So looking at this property, what would Angela Brown be using it for? It's an investment property, so she would find it really easy to, to get a tenant that would be happy to live in that property and pay a rent. When authorities examined the mortgage application on the Thornton Heath property, they were stunned. Angela Brown had declared an income to her mortgage lender of £92,000 a year. And that wasn't all. Credit checks suggested that Angela Brown's financial circumstances were in complete contrast to what she told the council. That showed that she had a substantial amount of money to pay each month for a car. It was the top of the range and she was expected to pay pounds a month to drive a car yeah, yeah. yet and applied for a council house property yeah, yeah and claimed benefit since 1999 angela brown had claimed more than 43000 pounds in income support housing benefit and council tax benefit how does that make you feel cuz that in itself as a small part of the case is just shocking in my opinion it's somebody that's living two lifestyles one lifestyle is set aside for the council but i'm sure to her friends outside and her business colleagues and um, everybody else that knows her she probably lives the high life later you have never had any property or income from property before nothing like that the property is mortgaged in my name but i've never had any income from the property a fraudster exposed on tape it's just lie upon lie as investigators come face to face with Angela Brown. We were one step ahead of her all the way through this interview. Social housing isn't confined to council estates and tower blocks in urban areas. Much of our social housing stock is in rural communities where property prices are high and wages are low. And in these communities, as well as towns and cities across the UK, the war on tenancy cheats is as fierce as ever. Fraud investigator Annette Tro knows how vital social housing is to the villagers across our countryside. It's important that we um, maintain the uh, social housing within village areas because you do find that people grow up there and they want to still live in that area and they might not necessarily be able to get onto the property ladder because of the cost within that area. It's a momentous day for Annette and her team from Bromsgrove District Housing Trust. OK, yeah, that's great. If you can uh, meet us there in about half an hour and uh, we can get the locks changed done. After a five-year fraud investigation, a precious social housing property has finally been recovered. It's very exciting to get the keys back today because this case we've been working on since 2011. So it, it is a, a, an achievement for us today. In 2011, this house took centre stage in a housing scam that united a community against a suspected fraudster intent on unlawfully purchasing a social housing property. It's like one of these villages where everybody knows everybody and they will fight for what's right. The case began when residents in the charming property. According to council records, tenant Charles Bayliss had been a resident of Bill Broughton his entire life. This gentleman had actually grown up in that property. He'd succeeded the tenancy from his father when his father away. Under social housing succession laws, a tenancy can be inherited or succeeded when a relative dies. The right to succession depends upon the applicant's relationship with the tenant, the type of tenancy the relative had, and when it began. Under law, succession can happen just once in a family. Having succeeded the tenancy from his father, Charles Bayliss had used up the right to pass it on again. So when Authorities began receiving calls regarding his daughter, they became concerned. We started having reports that um, our tenant wasn't living in the property, but his daughter was living there with her son. So we started to investigate. If Bayliss had moved out of the property, he had a legal duty to inform the council. Allowing his daughter to move in would constitute an unlawful use of council property. Authorities contacted the tenant who agreed to be interviewed. 
what he told investigators about his circumstances seemed plausible. The story was that she'd moved in to look after her father because he was very ill and that um, he did live there. Um, there was no doubt about him living there and he spent most of his time in the bedroom and he'd got his telly, etc. If Bayliss had been unwell and confined to his bed, it would explain why he hadn't been seen by neighbours. If her father did need the help to live independently in that property, we wouldn't stop that. To confirm the story, investigators asked if they could visit the property. It was then that their suspicions were further aroused. They went to the property. When they got there, our tenant hadn't got a key to the property, but his daughter had. When investigators went inside, the evidence suggested that what neighbours had been reporting was true. It was very evident that he didn't live in the bedroom. There was no bed that was made up. There was no television in there. It wasn't a room that was made up for somebody to live in as, as he said he was living in. All the signs indicated that the tenant had moved out and his daughter and her family had moved in. It was time for investigators to take action. There are people in need and that is what drives us on. We see these families that are desperate for housing and, well, we're going to deal with that. Later. Ultimately, the main aim was to get this property with a massive discount. Things escalate when the tenant attempts tenancy fraud. We'd also got a potential right to buy fraud. Earlier in Croydon, an anonymous tip off revealed that 45 year old Angela Brown had obtained a council flat despite purchasing this property in Thornton Heath two years earlier. We'd housed her into a council property when she already had a property of her own and that property was habitable. Analysis of Angela Brown's mortgage application revealed that she had an income of £92,000 a year and a finance deal for a top-of-the-range car. It's somebody that's living two lifestyles. She probably lives the high life. Fraud investigators needed to learn the full extent of Brown's deception. They teamed up with the Department for Work and Pensions to look more closely at Angela Brown's claims history. Benefits were being claimed that were their domain. They were happy to come on board and the investigation then became a joint investigation. And it was this joint investigation that uncovered a whole other level of fraudulent activity. In 1999, Two years before approaching Croydon Council and stating that she was homeless, Angela Brown had been receiving housing and council tax benefits while apparently renting a private property from a man in North Croydon. But when authorities discovered the identity of Brown's landlord, they were stunned. Through the investigation, it transpired that the landlord for that property and the owner of that property was in fact her husband. Angela Brown had been claiming benefits to pay bills property that she actually shared with her own husband. Over the course of nine years, Brown fraudulently claimed more than £43,000 in benefits. And not content with that, she decided to take her fraudulent behaviour one step further. Presenting herself to authorities as a homeless single mother in order to obtain a council property. What's more, Brown wasn't even living at the property she'd been allocated. She was in fact unlawfully subletting it to someone else while still living with her husband. Subletting is, is a real issue for you guys. It's one of the worst things you can do with a property that's been given to you. You've been given that property because you need somewhere to live. You've not been given that property to then hand it out to somebody else and, and make your own income out of it. In addition to receiving unentitled benefits for the house she shared with her husband, Angela Brown also received a regular income from lawfully subletting her council property. Bank records were visited to provide one of her children with a private education. It is a shocking thing when you see that somebody has got a comfortable lifestyle, shall we say, and there's no need for them to do it. It, it is pure greed. Angela Brown was a successful businesswoman allegedly earning more than £90,000 a year while claiming council benefits and social housing she wasn't to. 
This serial fraudster was living with her husband while owning a second property and subletting social housing obtained by deception. How would you describe Angela Brown? I would say that Angela Brown is a cut above your normal tenancy cheat. She's got a substantial income, more than most people I know, more than I would ever, ever imagine myself earning. But she still feels that she's entitled to have a account property and the only reason that I think that um, she thinks like that is because it's a source of income. On the 22nd of September 2010, Croydon's head of anti-fraud David Hogan invited Angela Brown to Croydon's council offices for an interview under caution. How we see it, we're giving people a chance to come clean. We're giving them a chance to come honest. It's really their choice as to whether they continue to tell lie upon lie or whether they realise that they have been caught and they're going to actually finally start telling the truth. The audio recording of Angela Brown's interview under caution provides a window into the world of a fraudster. Let me just play a little bit of the um, actual cassette tape for you and you can hear her. This interview's been taken for. Let's take your full name and address, please. Angela Brown. Investigators had done their homework. They had evidence, including land registry documents, and a mortgage application, which proved that Angela Brown had purchased a property in 2003. But in her interview, Brown used her son in an effort to distance herself from the purchase. I've never had any property. You have never had any property or income from the property? No. The property is mortgaged in my name, but I've never had any income from the property. But there is, uh, you do have a mortgage from property? Yes, but the property is for my son, nothing to do with me. amazing actually listening to Angela Brown talking there because she's really trying to come across as if she's done absolutely nothing wrong. I think what what strikes me here is she's actually using her children to if you like, create a defence for her own actions. The interviewer wants to uh, compound the ones that she's already started. Yeah. Next, investigators quizzed Brown on her son's private education. Having already contacted the school, they knew that Brown was paying the fees herself. But in the interview, she again had a different story. Is it private? And how are you funding that? It's got to go. How much are the fees? I don't think she's somewhere in 2013. So again, straight away, when questioned on the private school, she's come up with an excuse. The grandmother. And she's coming up with a version of events which, on the surface, might appear reasonable had we not already gone further and discovered how the fees were being paid at that school. We were one step ahead of her all the way through this interview. Angela Brown decided to stick to her lies and Croydon Council decided to prosecute. It would be down to a jury to decide the outcome. So what's going through your mind just before the verdict? We're there on the outside, just wondering what are these 12 men and women going to think and are they going to reach the right conclusion? At Croydon Crown Court on November the 7th, 2014, a jury found Angela Brown guilty of eight charges of dishonestly making a false representation and one of obtaining property by deception. Brown was sentenced to 12 months imprisonment. The property she fraudulently obtained could now be offered to a family in genuine need. And there was a positive outcome with this case, wasn't there? Yeah, I mean, in many ways, there were positive outcomes, both in the fact that we were able to deal with Angela Brown, but by getting the property back, we're able to put a deserving tenant in there. That property is occupied now by people. It's going to change their lives and, you know, sends them on their way to success. Then, you know, we've done incredibly well. Subletting is wrong anyway, sort of morally, ethically, it seems to be wrong. When you've got social housing, then it should be for your need. I went from a two-bedroom flat with two children, one male, one female, um, and I waited nine years for that, for my new property, which is a three-bedroom house, and it's just been such a struggle. 
to other people who can afford it, but they choose to cheat the system instead. Disgusting. That's stealing, actually. That's absolutely stealing. So I think people like that should be investigated and found out. Earlier, this house in the Worcestershire village of Bell Broughton became the subject of an investigation's family to move in. We had started having reports that um, our tenant wasn't living in the property, but his daughter was. After carrying out a visit to the tenant's house, investigators' suspicions were heightened, but now they needed to prove it. After receiving the initial tip-off from local residents, Bromsgrove District Housing Trust appealed to the community of Bell Broughton to help once more. The response was overwhelming. If you grow up in Bell Broughton, a lot of people have stayed in Bell Broughton, so you find that everybody knows everybody else. It's like one of these places where they will fight for what's right. Housing officer Susan Franklin is responsible for managing social housing stock in and around the village of Bell Broughton. It may only be a small organisation, but we are dealing with it, and it doesn't just happen down in bigger cities. It happens in small little country areas like this one. She asked one of the residents if she'd be willing to make a witness statement that could be used to build a case against their suspect tenant. This elderly lady, when, when I went to her, she just couldn't believe it, and she was, she was so willing to help. If, if you've got people that elderly that are willing to do that and know what's right or wrong, then we should be dealing with that straight away. One by one, more and more residents came forward who were willing to testify. They were all happy to make statements because they felt the same as we did, that this is tenancy fraud and it shouldn't be allowed to go on. They uh, all said, no, he hasn't lived here for years. It's been just his daughter and her family that have lived there. He pops in very occasionally. The statements these witnesses provided enabled investigators to show that Charles Bayliss had moved out. And that wasn't all. Investigators also took statements from locals who'd witnessed Bayliss at his other address, where he had apparently been living with his partner for nearly a decade. One of the witness statements here says, I know that your tenant has been at this property for approximately nine years on a permanent basis. In all, 10 Bell Broughton residents were willing to provide statements. Authorities were closing in on a tenant suspected of scamming the system for years. But in late 2015, the stakes were raised. A letter arrived at Bromsgrove District Housing, stating that Mr Bayliss wished to exercise his right to buy the property. A suspected fraudster who wasn't even living at the house was now attempting to buy it at a huge discount. If this right to buy had gone ahead, the tenant would have got a £76,000 discount on this property. This would have meant that a property with a market value of £210,000 would have cost Charles Bayliss less than £140,000. Investor was guilty of tenancy fraud. Now, we hadn't only got potential tenancy fraud where he hadn't used the property as his principal home, we'd also got potential um, right to buy fraud. Authorities invited Charles Bayliss to their offices, this time for an interview under caution. The tenant still maintained that he was living in the property. He arrived with his daughter and his solicitor and basically all we got was a pre-written statement and any questions we had no comment. So we had no alternative but to take this to court. In the weeks that followed, investigators worked around the clock, collecting evidence and taking statements. We had a very short window to get data together, and it was a massive, massive piece of work that we had to do. By the time the case was due in court, investigators could prove that their tenant was living somewhere else, and his daughter was living in his social housing property. We've got a very, very tight case here. It was very evident that the tenant wasn't living there, that his daughter was. We'd got proof and evidence of where he was actually living, um, that he wasn't coming back to the property. So we felt quite confident going into court. Authorities knew their case was solid, but for the sake of a swift conclusion, decided to offer Mr Bayliss a lifeline. We're not in the business of taking properties away from people or put, taking people through court, but we have to see 
that the right people are in the properties. Authorities agreed to drop the criminal prosecution if Bayliss was prepared to relinquish the property. On the 3rd of April 2017, he agreed. We went for the possession hearing last week and that was just a formality, just in and out of court. The judge gave us possession and that's where we stand today. We had the keys back and um, the property is now ours again. Charles Bayliss accepted a police caution for offences under the Fraud Act and the house was vacated. We would have lost that property. It would have been, it would have been bought. We would have lost that out of our stock. But now, um, it's done ours and somebody's going to get that. That's entitled to that property. Later. When we get there today, I'm, I would be surprised if the neighbours weren't outside. Emotions run high as housing officers return to the property in the wake of their investigation. Okay. Yeah, I'm good. <laughs> <Wow>. <laughs> such thing as a typical tenancy cheat and that no one is above suspicion, but just occasionally, when the fraudster turns out to be someone on the inside, it can take everyone by surprise. Our next case reveals an astonishing deception carried out by a council insider right under the noses of her unsuspecting colleagues. This is Rowley Regis, in the heart of the Black Country. Just 10 miles from Birmingham, this town in the borough of Sanwell is within commuting distance of the big city. It was here that Sanwell Council's fraud manager, Oliver Knight, uncovered a tenancy fraud that sent shockwaves through a public office intended to help those in need. I always like to think that I've seen everything for often that's not the case the story began in june 2007 when samuel council received what appeared to be a standard housing form from a young family needing social support we received a joint application from donovan marston and kadisha grant donovan marston and his co-applicant kadisha grant were not alone as one of the most deprived boroughs in the uk sandwell has 7,000 people on the social housing waiting list Ensuring that the right homes go to the right people is a priority for Sandwell councillor Steve Ealing. The, the country's in the, in the grip of a housing crisis and uh, social housing is part of that. So affordable housing, whether it's housing associations or local authority, uh, housing accommodation is extremely important to a significant proportion of, of the population in getting a decent home to live in. The application, Miss Grant stated that she was staying with Marston and her two children at a relative's property in Birmingham. Living conditions were overcrowded, and she hoped that Sandwell Council might secure them a property where she could finally settle and raise their children. In July 2010, her wish was granted when housing authorities offered them a family home in Rowley Regis. They moved in, it was a three bedroom property suited the needs that they put on their application. It was in a quiet suburban street, uh, a nice area, so something that they would have wanted. For Sandwell Council, it was the perfect result. A young family had been given a fresh start in Rowley Regis. What housing officers didn't know was that Kadisha Grant wasn't the struggling parent she'd had everyone believe. And in 2013, investigators began to learn the truth. So we data match on a regular basis, which is basically comparing the records that we have on housing records against other records to see if it should throw us up any just records. A match was made against one name. Kadisha Grant, a tenant for Sandwell Council, also appeared on housing records in the neighbouring city of Birmingham. Basically, what it showed is the fact that she'd got a tenancy in Sandwell that began in 2010 and another tenancy at another local authority. 2004. There could only be one explanation. Grant had obtained a property for her and Marston while she was already residing in social housing elsewhere. If the data was accurate, this was fraud. Investigators contacted their counterparts at Birmingham City Council, who confirmed that Kadisha Grant already lived in council property eight miles from Rowley Regis on the outskirts of Birmingham. This was in stark contrast to the information.
contact placed on the application form with Sandwell Council. When she made the application, she said she was living with relatives. What she didn't explain is the true circumstances, the fact that she'd actually got a tenancy elsewhere. So this is the application form that was submitted to the council in 2007. As you can see, Kadisha Grant here on, on her application, she's ticked the fact that she's living with relatives, when clearly she should have been ticking the fact that she was a council tenant. Under the Prevention of Social Housing Fraud Act of 2013, a false declaration on a tenancy application form constitutes fraud. Investigators decided to take a closer look at their suspects. They didn't have to look too far. Kadisha Grant was employed by a neighbouring local authority uh, in the housing department team. Investigators were stunned. Kadisha Grant was employed as a rents officer for Birmingham City Council. One of the very people responsible for supporting those with social housing needs appeared to be exploiting the system for her own ends. So this is a job summary for, that we, we obtained in relation to Kadisha Grant and the job that she was doing at the time. Um, and it, it, it outlines here. Uh, responsible for the provision of general clerical support to any aspect of the delivery of housing service. Uh, certainly from a housing point of view, if, if you were looking for someone who would know how to exploit the system, she's the sort of person you'd be looking for, for information from. Investigators, the evidence was clear. It was time to call in Marston and Grant for questioning. It appeared that they supplied false information on the application form itself, so therefore we were right able to ask them to attend an interview with a caution. On November the 12th, 2013, Kadisha Grant and Donovan Marston were interviewed separately. It was then that their deception began to unravel. Well, one of the main things that stuck out from, from the interviews is that between the two of them, they, they really couldn't get the story straight with regards to their living arrangements. In the relationship, Instead, they were friends and co-conspirators in a plan to secure Marston a precious three-bedroom council property that he would live in alone. Well, obviously, from, from our point of view, it, it goes against everything that we do. Um, you've got officers who are employed by councils um, up and down the country to help people out, and what she shouldn't be doing is using it for her own advantage. Uh, to help herself and her friends out uh, to get council properties when they, they, they don't deserve them. When authorities looked back at the pair's application, they uncovered a truly shocking story. After submitting a false application form, these fraudsters weren't prepared to accept just any property from Sandwell Council. Kadisha Grant and Donovan Marston had their hearts set on Rowley Regis. they wanted. Um, they were actually offered a property for, to begin with, um, which they turned down the offer. They were then offered a second property and they turned down that offer. And the process that we had in place at the time is that you get three offers, so they were given a third and final offer, which is the one they accepted. To already have a council property and then to have the cheek, not only to turn down an offer, but turn down two offers, just to make sure you got the one that you wanted. Um, yeah, it, 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 that one does really amaze me. Kadisha Grant's knowledge of the housing system proved to be her undoing. See, this is something whereby we can say, well, this person knows how to make a housing application and how to exploit the system if they wanted to. And that's what we felt had happened in the case of Kadisha Grant. Sandwell Council pressed charges against Kadisha Grant and Donovan Marston. And on the 16th of December 2014, they were found guilty of fraud. Both defendants were fined £300 in order to pay costs. £1,412. From a moral point of view, um, she knows people who would have come in contact with people who needed properties. Um, so for her to go and use her knowledge, her inside information, it obviously it, it beggars belief. Kadisha Grant no longer works at Birmingham City Council. As for the property, that could now be offered to a family in genuine need. Well, it just goes to show what some people try to get away with it's a success that we've uh, that we've recovered the property and it means that we've got a property to let to a, a genuine applicant who is looking forward to being able to live in a decent quality home and we can all feel good about that oliver and his fraud team are confident in the knowledge that anyone playing the system will be caught do i think she sleeps well at night not in the sun of property i know that 
earlier. OK, yeah, that's great. If you can uh, meet us there in about half an hour and uh, we can get the locks changed done. Authorities recovered the highly sought-after three-bedroom property in Belbroughton, Worcestershire. The judge gave us possession and that's where we stand today. We had the keys back and the property is now ours again. Hi, Wendy. Lovely to meet Thank you. you. Wendy Jones is an allocations manager for the Bromsgrove District Housing Trust. It's her job to ensure that the property goes to a deserving family. So let's talk a bit more about this property in question. It's in a lovely area, uh, quite sought after. This particular one would be considered to be um, a jewel almost because it doesn't, it, they don't become available very often. Just how does it feel when you are calling somebody up and, and saying, we are able to give you this property? It's the most wonderful feeling in the world to be able to give some good news that they can now um, have larger accommodation that will be suitable for their current family needs. It's really changing someone's life at the end of the it day, is. isn't it, getting a property like this? Any property is, is important to the individual, but if they get a particular property like this that, in a sought-after area, then obviously that's, that's, that's incredible for them as a family. Community's first manager, Annette Tro, is on her way to inspect the property for the first time and change the locks before a new family moves in. She's keeping her fingers crossed that the previous tenant hasn't left any nasty surprises. We're always surprised at what we find and how um, how vindictive, really, people can be um, when they leave their properties. The worst case scenario would be uh, if we got there and they damaged the property. Um, I went to one property once where they uh, had left the tap on in the bathroom and flooded the bathroom. Hopefully we won't have that this property. Some people will leave it in a good condition, and in all fairness to these people, they've left it in good condition. The priority for now is to make sure the property is secure. We've only got one set of keys, so it is important that we change locks tonight. It's took us years to get this property back, and we're not going to let the neighbours down now. In building a case against the previous tenant, Bromsgrove District Housing called upon the residents of Belbroughton to act as witnesses. Now the tenant is gone.
上搞波泳还算了吧。把网杆点上搞，直接送到。亚大的话，个人建议啊，在你的手套装出来之前，不要买。这种也挺赚的，说实话。我走到这里要五秒钟，回家八秒钟，十三秒，十三秒在温泉泡澡要泡十秒钟，二十三秒，我复活是二十秒，这样赚的，说实话。